from Matthew 11. I wish to say that Sunday I trust to resume preaching on James, but as I looked at the second chapter, um, I felt that it was going to take much more prayer, much more preparation, because it begins with, I think the New English Bible says, that, uh, in a, this is not the exact words, but let us not be guilty of snobbery. And the King James talk about the respect of persons, and that is preferring one man over another because of wealth or position or whatever. And I felt that I had to have more time to, to present that in a way that would be uh, arousing to us and effective. And so, as we went to a funeral this afternoon, um, I felt that the Lord would show me something else. And he said that he would. And uh, we were late because of an emergency call. That's not good, but sometimes it's better to take an emergency call. Someone needs help in time of trouble. And so we took the call. I took the call and was late. But we got into the funeral service about halfway and heard an old-fashioned minister with a very sweet spirit, light of God on his face, preach an old-fashioned truth about a new coming age in a place called heaven and a new body and a work well done. And it was a blessing. It was thrill. It was encouraging. But in the midst of that sermon, he spoke a passage that stuck out to me, will lift it out to me more than all the rest. I needed that passage. The words that he spoke were, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a great passage. But so often we preach it out of context. And I feel along with the great minister, and I'm not comparing myself with him, Lord deliver me. But I feel along with G. Campbell Morgan, who preached nearly all of his texts in context that we can't properly understand such a passage unless, unless we see its context. In my Bible, there's railroad tracks in front of the word come. I would advise you to strike those. That is not the Bible. That is someone trying to help us, and they felt like that, that there was a break here. There is not a break here. In fact, if you want to read the passage in context and get its context, you should at least start with verse 25. For verse 25 says, at that time. That, uh, that necessitates going back to whatever time he's talking about. At that time, what time? Well, if you look at 11, you'll see that John the Baptist was in prison. And he was perplexed and puzzled over the response to Jesus' ministry. And um, John, it had been revealed unto John the consummate work of the Messiah. But John's uh, revelation uh, had to do a lot with that which is yet to come. That is the burning of the chaff, that is the, the riding of all injustice. And he saw, if you please, what many people have seen in the great Messianic age or what all of us have seen in the age to come, the age of complete fulfillment and the, the age where... Everything is righted and uh, all wrongs are done away with. John saw that. And where those who have been against God receive their just due and are absolutely toppled and the righteous reign. Uh, it's apparent that John, as being a person like us, with a man like Elijah, didn't see everything. Jesus, of course, saw everything. But he wasn't upset with John. And he said, when John sent the word, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? He had already heard the Father speak. He had already heard him baptize at Jordan. He would already had the witness of the Holy Spirit. 
as to who Jesus was. He already had his mother's report when he leaped, like when he leaped with joy when he was still in her womb. He already had all that. And I think it should encourage and comfort us that the devil will fight when you've had the voice of God, when you've had the leading of God, when you've had the witness of the Holy Spirit as to the will of God and who Jesus is, the devil will still fight. And if things look perplexed and it looks, looks like things are not working out and there's disappointment and there's a discouragement and it looks like chaos and it looks like the devil has everything under control. Nevertheless, Jesus is still Lord and God still reigns and he has the whole world in his hands. Jesus can see it. Now, this is the context of, this, of these verses saying at this same time. And we need to see that by God's grace. But Jesus says, go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Now, I said, show him again. Remind him of something. Remind him that the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And John, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And I believe that John had a spiritual revival in prison that day when they brought these words from the Lord. But it's in that context that we're going to hear him say, Come unto me, all ye that are weary. Because the truth of the matter is, John is weary and heavy laden. Then he went, uh, then he talks to this age about the reception of John. After he sends John this encouragement, still looking at the context, said these departed unto John, and Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning him, What went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with a wind? And what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went you out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. And here is one of the greatest statements in all of Scripture. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. He that is least, that's going to connect up with at this same time. Then he goes on to tell some more things about how that he came said, and how that they, did, they can't read the signs, they can't get the light. Uh, they are uh, persons of learning. They're persons who have acumen for the things of the earth. They have the light as the children of the world, but they cannot put spiritual things together. And he says, uh, John came, their evaluation of him, came neither eating nor drinking, if they wanted a, an ascetic. And he said, you say he hath a devil. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Still, we're looking at the context. Then, after this, here's discouragement. Here is, the, here is what the, the, the way the age has received him. Here is even a troubled John. And he sends word, word back to John that John may be reassured and may be encouraged. And then comes these words of terrible woe. He began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you hath been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. At 
that time, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and of earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And then, in context, and in connection with all that's gone on before, for he has just praised the Father, and then we've had the reason for his praise. He says then, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will rest your souls, would be maybe a better translation. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The thing I want you to look at, perhaps a second, but it's first in my sharing, for I wanted you to get the context, first of all, is that Jesus worshipped in the face of difficulty and disappointment. His response to the rejection of all these cities was praise. His response to the rejection of light and the refusal of these cities who are going to be leveled to the ground and are leveled to the ground to this very day, we've seen this around the Sea of Galilee, his response was praise and worship. In fact, he was restful even, he was rest, he had rest in his soul even in the face of great obstacles disappointment, discouragement, difficulties. John in prison, the very forerunner of his own ministry, and yet his response to all of it is he turns his face to the Father and he said, Father, I praise thee and I worship thee. What a great lesson for us today. What a great lesson to our own souls when we have the discouragement of the day or the discouragements and the difficulties of the weeks and of the months and of the years, some grinding on and on and on. We have known by God's grace that we've done the Father's will. We have received the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have attempted to walk in his footsteps. We have attempted to do his will. Yet there are difficulties, there are obstacles, there are disappointments, and there are the multitudes who have re refused to see the light. Great miracles, yet they have not acknowledged that he is the Son of God, that God is the creator of the world, and that he has sent his Son. What should be our response? Like our Master, one of praise one of gratitude. Just, I think, like the spirit of Job when he said, though you slay me, yet will I serve you. And yet our Christ, the very one sin of God, saw a lot more than Job saw. And having, having a better perspective than John, the very son of God himself, for he listened to all that his father said. He says, oh, Father, I praise thee. What's the reason for his praise? The reason, you know, I, I'm tempted to say this. We could shut the sermon down now, sing our, uh, sing our closing song and go home. We could shut her down now and there ought to be enough happiness in this place. There ought to be enough, gr there ought to be enough gracious response to set everybody on a high plane, everybody on a great mountain of joy. If you've been heavy laden, I've been heavy laden. Have you had difficulty? I've had difficulty. If you had disappointment, I've had disappointment. Have you had great calamity? I've had great calamity. Are you in hard places for years? I've been in hard places for years. Have you had great suffering of the soul? I've had great suffering of the soul. It goes with being a part of the Messiah's ministry. What's our response to it? His response. Praise and adoration and worship unto the Most High God a knowledge and a faith that God has everything in his hands, a reminding and a remembrance that he is not being defeated in his purpose, 
that indeed the very rejection is the sign that his word has been given. For how can those who add two and two in the things of this world make sense of the wisdom of God? They cannot. How can those who have relied upon their own self-experience and their own self-knowledge or been prideful in the least way at all in what they've obtained in this life, how can they receive the light of God? Jesus said, he said, I praise thee, what for? That they do not receive the light. I praise thee that Capernaum and Chorazim and all of these have not received the light. It is not according to thy nature. The reason for his praise was that the revelation of the reality of God, the revelation of the purpose of God, the revelation of our relationships is hidden from the wise, but revealed to the immature and the untutored. Not not immature like childishness, but immature like childlikeness. It made sense unto Christ that he should be rejected. And in the face of all this, in the face of all this rejection, his coming and his dying and the need for the shed blood was all the more evident that the plan and the purpose of God was wise. And he praised his Father and he thanked him. And he was, he was lifted in the face of difficulty and disappointment. The condition for acquiring knowledge is conscious ignorance. He that is great in the kingdom, that is going to be greater than John, must be least in the kingdom of heaven. And if he be least, he is greater than John. That's a great statement. Notwithstanding, he that is that has a knowledge of his nothingness, he that truly knows that he is nothing, this man is greater in the kingdom of God. This man is greater than John the Baptist. I wouldn't want anybody to lift their finger to see if they had as much wisdom as John's got in this place. But it's not, that, it's not that question. It's the man who knows that he is entirely ignorant in his own knowledge and that whatever knowledge he has is not enough to save him or enough, enough to get him across the street. The great wisdom of Solomon was that he said, I don't know how to come in and I don't know how to go out. He was the greatest. He was the wisest for knowing that. He lost it. It would seem, but he knew that when he asked it, when he asked for that wisdom from God, he knew that he did not know how to come in and he knew that he did not know how to go out. Jesus is saying, oh Lord, you do not reveal this unto the prudent and unto the wise. You reveal it unto the unspeaking. The word for baby here is unspeaking. Well, that's less than a little child. That is the person who is consciously aware of their ignorance and their helplessness as to what is needful in this life and what is needful to get into the next life. Isn't that great? Oh, it is so tremendous. It is so tremendous. It is so tremendous. Now, what what is so wonderful is, what is so wonderful is, that is the way he was. Now get the context of the ver- uh, what he's saying. Come unto me because I'm like that. Come unto me because in my perfect humanity, I am not knowledgeable. Come unto me for in my perfect humanity, I'm, in, I'm entirely dependent upon his knowledge, on the revelation of Almighty God. In my perfect humanity, I do not think myself wiser than someone else. Think of it. In fact, he gave us a picture more of God than he did of himself. For he so did the Father's will and was so leased in the kingdom and so dependent upon God's will. In fact, he said, my meat is to do the will of my Father. Conscious ignorance. It's one thing. I don't know if you've ever thought about the Messiah in something like this, but this is what he's saying. Steve, God said he's going to give us something great tonight. 
I said, Stephen, I don't know what I'm going to preach on tonight, but I, I've come trusting Jesus, and I have a feeling that out of my experience in the funeral, he'll show me something. So when I went back home, I said, Jesus, what stood out in the funeral sermon more than me? He said the words, come unto me, go home, son, look those up. Go home and see what I'm really saying about that passage. So I went back and I was reminded of some studying that I'd done in times gone by and of a great sermon preached by G. Camel Morgan, which was along this line. And it was G. Camel Morgan who said, the condition for acquiring knowledge is conscious ignorance. The moment a man says he does not know The moment a man says that, he has fulfilled the first condition of acquiring knowledge. The moment a man says, I do not know, that man has now fulfilled not the second, the third, the fourth. He's fulfilled the first condition of acquiring knowledge. I don't know. This makes this dear brother who's been such an example to us so much more outstanding than I ever thought where I've heard him say often back in the rooms and in the places and across the world I'll hear him down on his knees or back of the desk he'll say oh Lord I don't know what to do I don't know what to say I don't know what to preach I don't know how you're going to lead, Lord, unless you rescue us. It's going to be a failure in this place. That's the first condition of requiring knowledge. And I've heard it over and over and over and over. You see, most of us, most of us enter a worship service and we know. We know days ahead of time. We know this and we know that. But oh, my dear ones, if we wait upon God, I believe that for every occasion of worship, for every moment of worship where Christians gather together, either in the privacy of the home, or in the home prayer meeting, cottage prayer meeting, or in the openness of the sanctuary, I believe God has a prescribed order of worship. And only that order of worship, only that leading of the Holy Spirit can fill the soul as God's been filling the soul tonight. Wasn't it wonderful when we heard the children saying, The kingdom of peace, it is reigning within. I felt an idea I might have felt the weight of the problems of this world, but right then and there, my soul was lifted. My heart was encouraged because I know the kingdom of God is unshakable. I know that the kingdom of God is marvelous and that it goes on unceasing, though the very foundations of this life are being shaken. When I was telling you about the goal, a while ago about when our next time of economic period would come, the Holy Spirit operated, told us when it would come. I don't need to frighten you. I tell you, we don't need to be frightened if we seek first the kingdom of God and his will. Seek the kingdom of God first. Listen to what the minister's trying to tell you about uh, paying debts. Listen to what he's been trying to tell you for these last few years and on some of these things of how to be financially responsible. Listen, there are certain principles that you and I must observe. Then when the shaking time comes by God's wonderful grace, we may have to have a raven bring the, bri- the biscuits in, but blessed be God, there's ravens that can bring them in to us and feed us. If he can feed the children of Israel a long time ago, he can still feed us. Or he may want us to prepare. That's all according to his leading, according to his work, and according to his love. Don't you, aren't you rested yourself by the very invitation? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You've heard the old story of how It's legendary, but it may be true. And over Joseph's workshop, Jesus had written, my yokes fit. My yokes fit. (laughs) So often the reason the yoke is so heavy, we're wearing the wrong one. We're not wearing his. There's only one burden with reference to his yoke and this, there's only one. See, the problem with you and the problem with me is we're trying to settle the difficulties and the trials of this life with some of our own self-knowledge and we're we're hitting concrete walls every time. It's bang, boom, bang. Weariness, discouragement, heartache, and calamity. There's only one burden to his yoke. You know what it is? One. It's the burden of his will. That's all. It's the burden of his will. What does he want me to do? 
and in, and in doing his will, we come to his knowledge. But what is the prerequisite to his will? It is a consciousness of our ignorance always and forever. And as we wait upon him, always knowing that, I, I, I must recall to your mind that Socrates searched all of his life for just one man in all of Greece that was as wise as himself. Having received the, or I, I need to explain to you that though he was polytheistic, uh, he heard the oracle of God. He lived up to all the light that he had and he was before Christ, but he heard the oracle of God and God said to him, Socrates, you're the wisest man on earth. And Socrates said, I won't explain that in case there's some doubters in the crowd or some persons who are slightly educated. You'll understand that I'm not ignorant, uh, but I'm, I'm conscious of my ignorance, but I have enough so that you won't be judgmental in your, to keep you from being judgmental of me in your seats. But I, but I want you to know that Alexander White preached the great sermon that challenged my soul. The, the old masters have the sermons that lift me clear back to Chrysostom and uh, to Augustine, but it was, it was um, uh, one of the great masters, Alexander White, who preached this, this sermon on Socrates. And it was that, that was through that sermon that I went, to, went back to read Socrates and learn of his life. Because the oracle of God, he come to him in his youth and had said to him, you are the wisest man on the face of the earth. And Socrates had responded, I, I thought God right to be right about everything until he told me that. I knew that I wasn't the wisest. So he set out and all of his life he went to reported men of wisdom. And as he would search them out, he would meet them face to face. And in a little while he would be pointing his finger at them. He would say, you are not so wise. Yeah, I can see after talking with you, you think yourself to be puffed up about this and about that. And Socrates would say right to their face. Now this is taking an extremely humble man, an extremely wise man. He would say to their face, I am wiser than you for I know one thing that you do not know. I know that I am nothing without God. And not once did he ever find, ever find one man like himself in his entire lifetime. That had a lot to do with why he drank the hemlock. He had aroused the hostility of the wise and the rich of Athens and of Greece. Think of it. That's what he meant by know thyself. And that's what Jesus is saying. Know thyself. And if you want to know yourself, come unto me. Don't go by psychotherapy. I'm not saying I'm against that, but, the, but its attitude is interned. If you want to know about yourself, turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you want to know about yourself, turn your eyes upon God. The knowledge of the holy is wisdom. And when you look at him and you look at the infinite resources and you look at creation and you look at the blood of his son and you look at all that he's done, the Red Sea and all the rest, you'll come to a knowledge of your nothingness. When you've tried your own way and found yourself at the end of the road, found it too hard to overcome by all that's been given to us by modern science and modern education, you know, you'll say, I'm learning. I am coming to nothing. But that's in the light of his walk and in the light of his presence. So when we come to Jesus, we learn that he is like one unspeaking. That is in complete helplessness. If God doesn't tell him what to do, he doesn't make a move. If God doesn't empower him, he doesn't make a move whatsoever. See, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. I never saw it before. Just before church, I saw that he was talking about himself. And it's so absolutely amazing to me because you and I, we speak quite a bit. We got quite a, we've got quite a few explanations to make. We've got a trail figured out here. We got, an in, we got a project engineered over here. We've got something figured out. We're gonna rely on self here. We'll put a little money in the bank over here. We'll figure it up over here. We've got it. Brother, let me tell you something. Without God sustaining us, it's all coming in on our heads. I tell you, unless we do what God tells us to do, there is chaos for us no matter how we try to build ourselves up and take care of ourselves in this life. But his burden is easy for it's just one thing. Not, not pleasing our neighbor, but pleasing God. Don't you ever say it's hard to please God. It is not hard to please God. Anyone who will do God's will, anyone who will see themselves in the light of God's everythingness and to see their nothingness can do something for somebody. 
If you take God's everythingness and take your nothingness, you can do something for somebody. You'll have purpose in this life. But let me tell you something. The hard pleasers are those around you. It's our neighbors, it's our friends, it's our own households, and it's the people around us that's hard to please, not God. Try it. Try to please them. Try to be at the right place at the right time in your own street, doing and saying the right thing. Try to take care of all the wishes and all the yearnings and all the questions and all the heartaches and all the guidances. Try it. You cannot. You can work and you can work and you can work and you can work and you will not please them. You will not please them. I look into the eyes of people who've been with me 14 and a half years and I see that I have not pleased them, though I have, though I have tried even to the breaking of health to please them. I cannot do it. I can see it more and more and more and more. I'm having to be taught, son, you're only to please me. You can never please them. But I know that I'll always please the man who's coming to a knowledge of his nothingness and who's endeavoring with me to try to do God's will. Now we understand a little better what it means when it says the way of the transgressor is hard. It's hard. It's difficult. But the way of the saint of God is to learn of him who is like the unspeaking babe to rest entirely upon his will and to do it. And in that, our difficulties are solved. And in that, our complexities are melted away. There's, we have a promise for the future that everything complex will be revealed. We have a promise that for the future, every unanswered question will be answered. We can't figure it out here. I used to sing it. We'll talk it over. Uh, I'll ask the questions. He'll tell me why. I don't know how many I'll be asking in heaven. I'm not sure that song's entirely right theologically. But the truth of the matter is, it'll all be settled. We have the promise, my friends, that it'll all be revealed after a while. When he comes and when we're in glory, it will be revealed. Jesus said unto us, come unto me, all ye that labor, and all and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. One statement from G. Campbell Morgan comes to my mind. He's reading the words of Jesus and he says, he's praying with Jesus here as he's delivering the sermon. He says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and the understanding. The men of acumen who put things together and imagine all God's truth can be expressed in the sequence of their reasoning and, disre and dids reveal them unto babes. And listen to this. Those who do not know anything, but who are dreaming towards truth, in whom is the spirit of romance, the spirit that soars. I love that. Such was G. Campbell Morgan, Father sanctify this sharing on this Wednesday night. I pray that my labor in the pulpit will be productive in the pew. I pray, Lord, that my people will rejoice over this truth. I thank Thee for our great Savior. I thank Thee for His humility, for His lowliness and His meekness of heart. And I thank Thee that in spite of difficulty and in spite of disappointment, in spite of heartache, we can look and worship and praise for all of this is a fulfillment of his nature and of his light. For we are in the process of triumphing in our own life. And we have within us this very night, the kingdom of peace 
And we are found even as him, as kings, reigning forever in the kingdom of God. Sanctify this to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.